Okay, uh, welcome to lecture here. And we're continuing on obviously uh, with uh, where we left off yesterday, uh, talking about sort of stoichiometry. We got into uh, molarity here. All right, here. Cool. And probably a calculator would be good, I imagine. Let's see. Grab one of those. There we go. All right. Uh, we are, I believe, right around here on the handout. So uh, like I mentioned, uh, we've been talking about sort of stoichiometry. Um, we talked about, again, basic stoichiometry problems um, where basically, again, you kind of follow those four steps where you do the mole-to-mole uh, -mole relationship. Uh, you had to convert to gram, make sure you had a balanced equation. Uh, we also talked a bit about limiting reagents. Um, and again, limiting reagents, you can really identify um, as a sort of limiting reagent problem by being given enough information um, about the reactants to really get the moles. And that's kind of the key thing there is that you're able to really get to moles uh, for everybody that's on the reactant side. In a lot of cases, that's usually just two reactants. Doesn't necessarily always have to be two reactants, but probably 99 times uh, is going to be just two reactants involved. And if you have enough information to get you to moles, and when I say enough information, Traditionally, and a lot of times what you'll come across is uh, grams of each of those, and you can convert those grams to moles. But as we'll talk about here in just a second, uh, you can sort of have a limiting reagent problem, for example, where uh, you're given enough information, say in terms of volume and molarity to get the moles or some other type of thing besides grams. So really the key is that you're able to get to moles for everybody in the reactant side, and uh, that's a key that it is a limiting reagent problem. So I basically focused on doing limiting reagent problems as sort of uh, ice tables, which is again, as I mentioned a number of times, sort of a convenient way to do those problems because uh, you could kind of figure out pretty much um, everything that will be asked of you pretty quickly um, by doing that ice table. Again, we talked about a couple other ways you could do them as well. And as I mentioned again, um, if you're comfortable with the way that you learned perhaps in the previous class, you're more than welcome to continue to do it that way as well. Um, then we got into uh, molarity. And again, molarity is moles per liter. And molarity, which is big M, is pretty much the most common unit of concentration that we come across for solutions. And it is moles of solute over liters of solution, technically speaking. And most of the time as well in that one, you usually have to do a gram to mole sort of conversion uh, to get to the moles. Uh, the key there is you do need the volume needs to be in liters when you're using it or trying to calculate the molarity. Uh, so that's oftentimes something where people kind of mess up on, they forget to kind of convert it to, uh, to liters. Um, so from molarity, you really can solve for three different things uh, depending on the information that's given to you. Since molarity is moles per liter, you can uh, obviously calculate the molarity. If you have the molarity and the volume, you could get the moles. And lastly, obviously, if you have the moles and the molarity, you could get the volume. So uh, that sort of molarity formula, I'll call it, I guess, a formula, um, is very useful as well and used a lot in chemistry. A lot of times it's used with solutions, which we're gonna get touch upon here in just a second. Uh, today, but it's used a lot of times in solutions to really get the moles of something and using the volume and the molarity to do so. We also talked about the idea of dilution. Um, and dilution really is the process where we make, as we talked about here, um, a sort of more dilute solution from a more concentrated solution. So a more concentrated solution in terms of molarity is usually, again, what we usually refer to um, we'll have a higher molarity. And then obviously when we make a more dilute solution, we have a 
uh, solution that has a lower molarity. And the reason for that is what we see here in the top left and we talked about last time, when we actually look at molarity, um, molarity again is that moles of solute over liters of solution. So technically when we do a dilution, really the only thing that we are changing uh, is the volume. So the moles of the solute remain the same. So the top part of the molarity sort of formula there uh, remains the same. But what changes is the bottom part. So as we add more solvent, the volume of solution gets larger and larger. And what that's going to do essentially is make a small number on top divided by a larger number on the bottom. And that's going to bring the molarity down in terms of its value. So the molarity will come down. And that's why we usually think about it in terms of M1 V1 equals M2 V2 as the dilution equation. Uh, again, on the very, very top there, you can see as well as we talked about that sometimes it's not just M1 V1 equals M2 V2. Uh, some people use more generic version of dilution equation and that is C1 V1 equals C2 V2. The C there is the concentration. So just a generic term for concentration. Again, although molarity is the most common unit of concentration, it's not the only unit of concentration. We're gonna talk about a few more here uh, today as well. But there are other units of concentration, so you technically can use any unit of concentration in there uh, for any of these guys. Uh, any questions on that there? Also, while we're looking at this equation, it's really important to understand when to use this equation and when maybe not to use this equation. Um, typically speaking, this is really the dilution equation, the M1 V1 equals M2 V2. Um, we're gonna talk about titrations and stuff very shortly here. And sometimes people will refer to this equation as the titration equation. And it does work correctly in that situation but only for a specific sort of situation that's going on. And we'll sort of point it out maybe as we do those calculations, but um, it won't work 100%. So you may sometimes see people refer to this sometimes as a titration uh, formula, and it's truly really not in all cases uh, universal, but it definitely is more the, the dilution equation. Any questions on that stuff there that we talked about last time? Let's see, we did this guy. So actually, before we get to this one, why don't we try another dilution one just to make sure. So why don't you try this one? Uh, what volume of water is needed to prepare 500 milliliters of a 0.25 molar calcium nitrate solution uh, from a five molar calcium nitrate solution. All right, so why don't you take a minute or two here and come up with uh, the answer and see what we do.
Okay, so let's take a look here and see. Uh, so again, this is a dilution equation or formula. Uh, we are starting with uh, calcium nitrate and calcium nitrate, and we want to go from a five molar to a, two po a 0.25 molar. So again, visually what we're happening is we have a five molar solution. We want to make a secondary solution here that has a concentration of 0.25 molar and has a volume of 500 milliliters. So again, we can use our M1V1 equals M2V2. For the most part, the uh, more concentrated one, which would be the five, is usually the ones. Uh, so we do have the the, uh, the five molar there. We also have the 0.25 and the volume of 500. So if we solve for V1, would be M2V2 over M1. Again, our more dilute guys, which is our 0 0.25 molar, our volume, which is 500 milliliters, divided by our molarity of five. Again here, the molarity will cancel and we will be left with milliliters at this point. And if we do that, we will end up with 0.25 times 500 divided by five equals 25. Now, the important part here is to realize that that 25 milliliters is actually how much of the more concentrated guy we're going to take out and actually put into here. So that's really 25 milliliters of our calcium nitrate. But the question really wants to know how much water we're going to add. So as we talked about last time, the rest of this will technically be water and we need to figure out basically how much that would be. So we've already put 25 milliliters in there and we want to end up at a total volume of 500. So usually, as I mentioned last time, to find the volume of water, you actually need to take the V2 minus V1. And that means that we would take 500 minus 25, gives us about 475 milliliters of water should go in there with it. So 475 of water, plus the 25 of the calcium nitrate in there. And if we mix it up really good, we should end up with a solution that has a molarity of 0.25. Any questions on that there? So as I mentioned last time as well, uh, very, very common in, in sort of dilution problems. Um, they oftentimes will ask you about the water a lot of times. So it's a very, very common sort of dilution question. Any questions on that there? Okay, so what we're gonna now talk about is uh, kind of putting these two things together that we've been talking about. Uh, we're gonna talk about really molarity and, and concentration, and we're gonna talk about stoichiometry. So we're gonna kind of put both of those things together and basically do really solution stoichiometry. So solution stoichiometry a lot of times is uh, really nothing more than a really stoichiometry type problem our basic stoichiometry problem like we've done in the past. But really the main difference is how we get the moles to begin with a lot of times. So up to now, a lot of things that we've done is basically take grams and convert them to moles. And we do that with the molar mass. So when we're dealing with solutions, obviously we don't typically have grams, right? And what we typically have with solutions is, is much easier to look at it in like a graduated cylinder or something like that and take a volume reading. Uh, so usually with solutions, what we have is volume and molarity. And the advantage of volume and molarity is, as we hopefully will remember, that we can actually get, try that again, we can get the moles by taking the liters times the molarity. So liters times molarity will get us moles. So that's usually the difference here and sort of the stoichiometry problem that involves solutions, we, uh, we use volume and we use molarity to get moles. Kind of the middle part of the calculation is pretty much the same. You do all the same sort of steps, balanced equation, get to moles, uh, mole to mole relationship. And sometimes at the end as well, in, in sort of a solution stoichiometry problem, uh, you will also be required to figure out, uh, say volume or something like that. So 
what you would do at the end is use moles and molarity and figure out volume, or you could even figure out the molarity of a substance. So a lot of times the solution to stoichiometry is sort of the middle part, pretty much the same in terms of the steps that you do for stoichiometry, just the beginning parts that are a little bit different. Uh, you usually will have to incorporate molarity and volume and moles uh, in those sort of steps. So let's go back and actually talk about a couple of things here. So one very common procedure where we sort of get into some solution stoichiometry is a one type of reaction, which as we talked about before is a precipitation reaction. So a very common sort of experiment that's done is you mix a couple of solutions like we see here in the picture. And obviously if we had these solutions, most of often what we would have in terms of them would be molarity and volume, right? And again, from that molarity and volume, you can get the moles. And usually when you do that, as you can see there, that white solid forming in the middle picture, uh, you could isolate the white solid and figure out how much product that you actually made as a result of that. And you could dry it out on the filter paper, weigh the precipitate, and you could use really the equation and the reaction to figure out things like uh, how much product you should have produced, like a theoretical yield. Uh, using solution stoichiometry, you also could figure out, you know, if you knew how much product you made, you could go backwards and figure out maybe the molarity or something of the solution uh, that you started with. So just to illustrate, it's sort of a calculation that involves uh, that. Let's take a look here. We can find one here. So let's say we, uh, let's do an example of a problem similar to this here. We'll come back to that in just a sec. We'll use this page. So let's say we want to calculate the, uh, want to calculate the mass of solid sodium sulfate that must be added to 250 milliliters of a 0 0.2 molar solution of barium nitrate. To precipitate out all the barium as barium sulfate. And what is the mass? We'll do two problems here. What is the mass of barium sulfate produced? Okay, so let's take a look at sort of how we would approach this. This really is sort of a stoichiometry problem. And you would start it just like a normal stoichiometry problem. We're basically reacting sodium sulfate with barium nitrate. So you wanna start with the equation. So hopefully at this point, you could recognize that. Really solid on that. That this is a double displacement reaction, right? We got a positive negative guy here with the sodium sulfate, positive negative guy here with the barium nitrate. As we talked about, we want to put everybody together with their proper formulas first. So barium will switch over with the sulfate, which is plus two and minus two. The sodium, which is plus one, and the nitrate, which is minus one. Again, even though there's twos here, like we talked about, the actual correct formula would be NaNO3. Again, you want to start with the correct formulas first and then end up with the balance equation. So in this case, uh, to balance it, it looks like we need a two right about there. That takes care of two sodiums on each side, two nitrates on each side, one barium and one sulfate on each side. So uh, we're good on that. Now, when we think about the piece of information that's given to us, really the only piece of information that's given to us is we have 250 milliliters of 0 0.2 molar barium nitrate. So again here, when we look at this, we have uh, volume and we have molarity. So thinking about the molarity equation, 
we can get moles and moles would equal the liters times the molarity. So we do need to convert our milliliters into liters. So if you move the decimal place over three places, you will end up with 0.25 liters times the molarity here, which is 0.2 moles per liter. And that's gonna give you, Point zero five moles of barium nitrate. So really at this point, all we've done is pretty much equivalent to what we've done in previous stoichiometry problems, where we take the grams and we take the molar mass and get moles. We basically did the same thing here. The only difference is instead of using the grams and the molar mass for the periodic table, we're using the molarity and the volume to get to moles. Any questions on that? All right, so the first part of the question is really how many, how many grams of sodium sulfate do we need if we started with this guy? So right now we're sitting right here in terms of information. And because this is a stoichiometry problem, we're not interested in this guy to begin with. We're actually interested in the guy over here. So this is really where the stoichiometry part comes into play. From the equation, we can see it's a one mole of sodium sulfate gives you one mole of barium nitrate. So this very much like a normal stoichiometry problem, we're going to use the mole to mole relationship from the equation to calculate how many moles of sodium sulfate we need. And if we do that, continue it on with our number previously, It's a one-to-one -one relationship, which makes the math not too bad. One mole of barium nitrate gives us one mole of our sodium sulfate. So I think I could do that without the calculator, hopefully. 0 0.05 moles of sodium sulfate. So that is like the stoichiometry part that we traditionally do just like normal, a uh, mole to mole relationship. And we're close to what we want, but mass, right, usually means grams. So to convert our moles into grams, we need to go to the periodic table and we do need to calculate the molar mass of sodium sulfate. So if you go to the periodic table, that is two times 2299 for our sodium plus uh, 3207 for our sulfur plus four times 16 for our oxygen gives us 142.1. So to figure out the grams that we would need to throw in there, we would do a normal sort of calculation here. We would take uh, the pen writing the right way. There we go. 0 .0, 0 0.05 moles of sodium sulfate using the molar mass from the periodic table, 142.1 is going to give us 7.10 grams of sodium sulfate would be needed. So this is one part of the question that was asked. And hopefully you can see a lot of similarities to the basic stoichiometry problems like we've done in the past, just to sort of highlight those four steps. Step number one, like normal, is have a balanced equation. Step number two is to get the moles of what they gave you. Again, this is the major difference here is we're using molarity and volume to do that. Step number three is the mole to mole relationship. And step number four is to convert those moles into some other unit. So again, the same basic steps. The only difference is uh, using molarity and volume to do so. Now, the second part of this question was actually how much product we would make. So we could do this a couple of ways, but we can come back here to our moles of barium nitrate, which we have right here. 
And we now could go using stoichiometry to our barium sulfate and figure out how much barium sulfate we would actually produce. So I'm gonna pick that up here on the next slide. So we have 0 0.05 moles of barium nitrate. So using 0 0.05 moles of barium nitrate, we would then do the mole to mole relationship because remember at this point, we kind of are at step number two. So step number three, again, would be the mole to mole relationship. And this equation is nice. It is a one to one relationship between these two guys, which makes it also very easy. So one mole of barium nitrate will give me one mole of barium sulfate. Again, will give us the same number. And at this point, just like before, we want to convert those moles into grams. So in this case, we need barium, which is 137.3, looks like 137.3, sulfur 3207, and again, four times 16, for our oxygens gives us 233.4. So taking this guy 0 0.05 moles of barium sulfate. Wow, 233.4 grams per mole. About 11.7 grams a barium sulfate would be produced in this reaction. And since this is a product and how much should be produced, this again, to tie it to what we've been talking about, would be our theoretical yield in this case, because it's our product. And again, this is step number three, and this would be step number four. So hopefully you can kind of see in this, uh, it pretty much is the same steps. Uh, again, the slight difference is, you know, we use, uh, molarity volume to get moles and potentially at the end you could use the molarity and volume again. Any questions on any of those steps there? Okay. Now another place where we sort of get into solution stoichiometry is another process and we'll go back to that slide which is this one here and this is the process known as titration and Titrations is basically when we add a solution of sort of known concentration to a solution of unknown concentration. And as you can kind of see it here, uh, this piece of equipment, which is known as a burette, is used to deliver the solution. So usually in this sort of setup is exactly what you see here. A burette really is just a long glass sort of tube. And at the end, it sort of has a little guy that you call a stopcock, which is actually this part right here. And basically it's just a little kind of switch that you turn on, you turn off, basically you turn it on, turn it off, and it kind of opens and closes it. Um, if it's in this direction, kind of uh, parallel to the actual glass tube, then it's on. If it kind of goes perpendicular, it kind of closes it, you know, so it's just a little thing that you turn. And on the bottom, usually we have some type of flask, a beaker, something like that. And usually, again, uh, we could add solution from the burette into the beaker or flask, which is a flask here. And we will do this titration. And when we do a titration, and especially a lot of times an acid-base titration, which is the uh, next major experiment there, which is an acid-base titration, we basically will continue to add for example, base to acid um, in that particular type of titration uh, until we reach what is known as the equivalence point. And the equivalence point is the point when the reaction is complete. And in the case of an acid-base titration, what that really means is the moles of the acid equals the moles of the base. So in an acid-base titration, which is, I would say, probably the most common type of titration that you do, is some type of acid-based titration. You could definitely do uh, like a precipitation titration and other things, but probably nine times out of 10, this is probably the uh, type of titration that you're gonna be probably seeing. 
And when we reach the equivalence point in terms of an acid base titration, that is the point where you have exactly equal amounts of the acid and base. And basically what that means is, if you think about it in terms of a reaction, at the equivalence point, whatever you had of this guy in terms of moles will equal exactly what you have of this guy. And that's why we call it pretty much the reaction is complete because all of our reactants are gone at that point. It's basically what that means. Everything technically should have been converted into products at that point. And you have nothing left really on the reactant side. Now the equivalence point, again, like I said, in terms of acid bases, when those guys equal each other, um, and it shouldn't be confused with another term that sometimes is used when we talk about titrations. Uh, when we talk about titrations, sometimes people refer to it as the end point. And the end point in the titration is pretty much what it sounds like. It's like when you lay it up and call it a day, you stop your titration. Now in a very good titration, if you do a good titration, your end point and your equivalence point should pretty much be the same spot. Yeah, so that goal is to get to the equivalence point. Again, sometimes a term of endpoint is used. And again, that's just really where you just kind of stop your titration. So how do you know when you hit that point or that equivalence point when all these guys are pretty much used up? We usually use an indicator. And most indicators are weak acids. And indicators actually work for the most part over a pH range. So usually indicators will work over a specific pH range. So for example, phenolphthalein, uh, which is probably what is used here in this kind of pinkish color, uh, phenolphthalein is a very, very common indicator. It's the one that's gonna be used out in uh, experiment 10 as well. And in terms of phenolphthalein, it is actually colorless in acidic solutions. It is actually colorless in neutral solutions, it actually only becomes pink in basic solutions. And actually something like phenolphthalein, for example, works over a pH range of 8.3 to 10. So right around 8.3, if you're not familiar with the pH scale, a reminder that the pH scale above seven on the pH scale is basic. So obviously it starts at 8.3 where it sort of works. So obviously that's in the basic range to begin with. So at about 8.3, phenolphthalein is actually still colorless. And as you gradually move over heading towards 10, it goes from really shades of like barely pink to super, super dark pink as you hit around a pH of 10. And usually when you use something like phenolphthalein or usually the acid base titrations that you do say in a class like we would do in experiment 10 or even in uh, Chem 200B you might do. Uh, usually when you are yelled at in terms of uh, doing titrations is you're yelled at like, hey, stop your titration when you see the very, 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 I'll say it one more time, very first shade of pink that stays so light pink that you got to almost take a white piece of paper or something white to put underneath it to kind of see the tinge of pink. Um, you're not really shooting for super dark pink, although it's a nice color when you get there, but uh, it's not really what you want. And that's because when you typically do a, uh, a titration, acid base titration, like the ones that you do, and even the ones that we would do in experiment uh, 10, the equivalence point happens around a pH, you know, in the eight-ish to nine-ish range, which puts you at the very beginning of where this indicator will work. And at the very beginning, again, it's colorless. So if you could stop your titration right when you first see that first little bit of color, you probably will be very close to where the equivalence point actually is. Now, if you wait until you get like super dark pink, you might be at this end of the scale and you may be, significantly past the actual equivalence point. And really what an indicator is, is just sort of a visual reference for you when you're doing the titration that, oh, wait, I've hit it, I should definitely stop. And that's why you'll learn more about this in 200B, but when you choose an indicator, you wanna choose one where you actually can see the color change occur um, to give you that indication to stop. So for example, if I, 
if I was doing a titration where the equivalence point was say a pH of 12, for example, in that area. If I use phenolphthalein, it would not do me very much good because as soon as it gets near a pH of 10, it's gonna be solid pink and remain solid pink all the way to 12 and stuff like that. So I won't have any visual way to know I should stop. So when you look at indicators, they typically have this pH range where they work. And again, you typically wanna choose one that is appropriate for your titration that will actually change color and you're able to visually see the color change occur near that equivalence point. Um, and again, in 200B, you'll talk more about indicators and sort of the correct way to choose them. Uh, we don't get into too much of that, but that's sort of the idea behind it. That's actually a pretty good titration there. Uh, on the right there is kind of light pink, maybe a little dark, actually. You could get it even lighter. I've had people where literally they've, they've hit it and you gotta put like some paper towel underneath it to actually see you know, the actual color and stuff like that. Now, um, <clears throat> we do titrations and really titrations in terms of the calculation part are really just solution stoichiometry problems where we use the volume and the molarity really to determine uh, something. So a lot of times what we're interested in when you do a titration is you're kind of interested in the concentration of something. Uh, you could be interested in how much volume, but a lot of times we are interested in something like uh, the concentration of an unknown. So if you sort of know the concentration of what you're adding, for example, and you know how much you added, you could figure out the moles of it and then use stoichiometry to figure out the moles of what you were reacting it with. So the idea here is when you have this guy in, in the flask, let's just say this is the acid. There's really only so many moles of acid that's flying around in there. And it's really not the molarity here that's changing or reacting, it's just the moles part of it. And there's only so many moles of acid in the flask. And when you add your base up here, if this was a base, there's so many moles of base that you're adding. So basically, again, it's the moles here that are reacting. And as we'll talk about, and as you'll probably talk about more if you take 200B, molarity in a titration is constantly changing. So we think about molarity a lot of times uh, when we're doing titration is we think more about the moles of it reacting because moles remains constant. Regardless of whatever the molarity of this solution was to begin with, there was only so many moles in there to actually react, moles of the acid in this particular case. So let's take a look at one here where we can uh, figure out certain things. So why don't we try this one? What is the volume of 1.42 molar sodium hydroxide that's required to titrate 25 milliliters of 4.5 molar sulfuric acid? So why don't you take a second, see how far you could get on this. Again, think about in terms of stoichiometry and solution stoichiometry. Think about what you need and see what you come up with. Take a couple of minutes and then we'll talk about it here in a second.
Okay, so let's see how we're doing. So again, this is really a titration problem, it's just for orientation purposes. Uh, so you have an idea of sort of where everything is. We have basically up in the burette would be our sodium hydroxide. And we're pretty much adding it down into a beaker, a flask, whatever it may be, our sulfuric acid. So again, here we're adding our sodium hydroxide. We wanna basically go, and sometimes the words that you'll see instead of required to titrate, um, you'll sometimes see the word uh, neutralize or neutralize. You'll sometimes see that. And if you do see the word sort of neutralize, it should be sort of a trigger, especially obviously with acid and bases, that it probably is some type of titration problem that you're doing. So since it really is a titration problem, it really is a stoichiometry problem. So we want to approach it the same way. We want to start with an equation. Uh, so that is going to be our H2SO4 uh, plus our sodium hydroxide. And as we talked about with types of reactions, this really is an acid-based neutralization reaction. It really falls under that classification of double displacement reactions. Remember what makes up an acid is H plus and some type of negative guy. So this is a positive negative guy. This is sodium, which is positive hydroxide, which is negative. So again, here we're gonna have that double displacement. The hydrogen and the H plus and the OH are gonna to come together like we talked about and make our water. The sodium, which is plus one, will come together with the sulfate, which is minus two and give us our Na2SO4. Remember that when we have an acid and base, we basically produce a salt and water, right? Water here and the sodium sulfate here is our salt. Now, we also wanna make sure it's balanced and in this case, it is not balanced. So we do need to put a two there. And I think we might need a two right there as well. And that should balance it up for us, I think. So we have two and two is four hydrogens. Uh, 1SO4, 1SO4, two sodiums. So we should be good, I think, in that case. Now we want to think about what is given to us. So in terms of what's given to us, what is the volume of sodium hydroxide? So we're looking really here for the volume, but we do have a piece of information given to us about sodium hydroxide. We do have 1.42 molar. So if you think about molarity, which we've been talking about, which is moles per liter, we see that we are looking for the volume here for the sodium hydroxide. We are given the molarity of the sodium hydroxide. So you can see that the only thing that's missing to allow us to calculate the volume is the moles of sodium hydroxide. So we don't have moles of sodium hydroxide. So ultimately, if you want to think about it, that's kind of like your first goal is I need to figure out the moles of sodium hydroxide. I obviously cannot do it from the sodium hydroxide information, but I do have a couple other pieces of information here. I do have that I have uh, 25 milliliters of this guy, and it has a molarity of 4.5 uh, molar. So again, if we think about the molarity of our acid, what was given to us is the molarity and also the volume. So for the acid, I do have enough information to get to moles. And that is ultimately how we're gonna get to moles of sodium hydroxide is through stoichiometry. So here, because I do have enough information to get the moles of our sulfuric acid, that will allow me to get to moles of our sodium hydroxide, which is what we need. And ultimately that will allow us to solve this problem and figure out the volume. So again, this really is just a stoichiometry problem. The next thing we wanna do is take whatever they gave us that we have enough information to get to moles, which would be this guy. So to get to the moles of H2SO4, we need to convert our volume into liters. So we're gonna divide it by a thousand or move the decimal point. We're going to multiply it by the molarity, which is 4.5 moles per liter of sulfuric acid. And if you do that, 0 0.025 times 4.5 gets you 0.1125, we'll call it.
So we've converted to moles, but we're still problematic because we're still stuck here. We ultimately need to get to our sodium hydroxide. And we can see that we can use stoichiometry to do that. We see from the equation here that it is one mole of H2SO4 gives me two moles of sodium hydroxide. So just like a normal stoichiometry problem, we're going to use that to get us to sodium hydroxide and moles of it. So 0 0.1125 moles of sulfuric acid, which we're not interested in. Using stoichiometry here, we're gonna get rid of the sulfuric acid, which is one mole H2SO4, gives me two moles of sodium hydroxide. The moles of H2SO4 are gonna cancel. We're gonna multiply that by two. Going to give us 0.225 moles of sodium hydroxide. So at this point, we have now got over here. And if you remember, that ultimately was sort of the missing piece that we needed here. So now for the sodium hydroxide, we have the molarity that was given to us. We also have the moles of it that we got through stoichiometry. So again, here in titration problems is a little bit different than normal problems that we've done to stoichiometry. Usually at this point, we would use the molar mass and figure out the grams. But in this case, we're actually interested in the volume, which is a common thing because obviously we're dealing with solutions here. So we are going to use that molarity is moles per liter. We now have moles, we have molarity, which means that the liters uh, excuse me, is equal to moles divided by molarity. So using our numbers here, we will take our 0 0.225 moles of sodium hydroxide. We're going to use the molarity really like a conversion factor. So I'm going to flip it so that the moles are on the bottom. So that's going to be 1.420 moles per liter of sodium hydroxide. That is essentially dividing by the sodium hydroxide, but dimensional analysis way, we see the moles cancel. And if we do that, gives us 0 0.158 liters of sodium hydroxide, which, if you multiply by a thousand, gives you 158 milliliters of sodium hydroxide would be needed. Question on any of those sort of steps. I hope you could kind of see the same really four steps that we've been talking about in terms of stoichiometry, balanced equation, convert to moles, mole to mole relationship and convert those moles into some other unit, which is step number four. So this is a very common sort of uh, solution stoichiometry problem that's done with titrations. You oftentimes will have to use molarity at the beginning like we did here to get the moles and then use molarity at the end to find something like volume um, or maybe molarity even at the end, you might have to use it uh, if you have the volume and not the molarity. Any questions on that? What does this number really mean? This number really means is if you did this titration in order to reach the equivalence point to the point where all of the moles of the sulfuric acid would be used up by the sodium hydroxide, you would need to add 158 milliliters to reach that equivalence point. Any questions on that one there? So why don't you try one here just to make sure. Why don't you do uh, what volume of 0 0.1.15 molar nitric acid is needed to neutralize 45 milliliters of 0 0.55 molar KOH. All right, take a couple minutes to see what you come up with.
Okay, so let's take a look. Um, so same idea, we're doing a titration. Um, we are uh, going to need an equation. So we have our nitric acid plus our potassium hydroxide. Again, this is a strong acid, strong base combination. So as we talked about, we are going to do a salt and water. So again, the water gonna come from the H from the acid, the OH from the base. The salt is gonna be the other two guys come together. Again, also a double displacement reaction. So K is K plus, uh, nitrates minus one. So KNO3 would be our equation here. And we do wanna make sure it's balanced, which in this particular case, it actually is. I got two H's on each side. I got a K on each side and like an O and an O and an NO3, so everything's good. So we're looking for the volume. So just like last time, uh, we're actually looking for the volume of this guy. And again, in terms of this one, we do have the molarity given to us. So really just like before, sort of the missing piece that we need to actually solve this is the moles of the nitric acid. It's sort of that missing little puzzle piece to allow us to actually complete the problem. And we could get that missing piece just like last time from the other information that's given to us. So again, we have 45 milliliters of our base and we do have the molarity, which is 0.550 molar. Again, from this information, we actually do have enough information to calculate the moles. So that's where we wanna start just like we did last time. Since we do have enough information from this guy to get to moles, that's a good place to start. Since we have volume and molarity, remember that when you're doing molarity and volume together just by themselves, you definitely need to convert your volume into liters. So uh, 0 0.045 liters of KOH. Again, divide by a thousand or you can move the decimal place three places to the left. We're going to, again here, multiply by the molarity of our KOH, moles per liter. Again, a reminder that when you have that big M, that is the same as 0.55 moles per liter, right? And again, you could use that as a conversion factor like that, or if you needed to, you could flip it around. Number always stays with the moles part, liters always one. Liters here is gonna cancel, and that will get me Point zero two four eight moles of KOH. So again, what makes this really a stoichiometry problem is at this point, I am stuck right here. But as we've been talking about, I do want to get over to here. So that is again where the stoichiometry part of it comes into play. We see that from the equation, every one mole of nitric acid will give us one mole of KOH, which is a nice relationship. By the way, not always gonna be a one-to-one -one relationship, so you definitely wanna make sure you balance that equation and check it. So starting with our moles of KOH, we're gonna use that relationship to get rid of the KOH. Again, from the equation, one mole of KOH gives us one mole of nitric acid giving me 0 0.0248 moles of nitric acid. So at this point, we now have the moles of nitric acid. We have the molarity of nitric acid. So just like in the previous problem, we could use that to figure out the volume. So here we would start with our moles of our nitric acid. We're going to use the molarity of the nitric acid really as a conversion factor, which means I actually do need the moles on the bottom. So again, um, I'll write it here, 0 0.15 big M is the same as 0 0.15 moles per liter. So I'm gonna use that as a conversion factor. I'm gonna flip it so that the liters are on top because I'm looking for volume and I want the moles to cancel out on the bottom, which they do. And if I do that, divided by 0.15, gives me 0.165 liters 
are about 165 milliliters if you convert it to milliliters of nitric acid. Any questions on those steps? Again, hopefully you can see a pattern. Step one, balance equation. Step two, convert to moles. Step three, mole to mole relationship. Step four, convert those moles into something else. Any questions on that there? All right, let's take a look at one more type of titration problem. And again, we're going into that big experiment next week where there's nothing but these problems. I think I got an empty spot there, yeah. Okay, so why don't you try this last little titration problem here. And again, these will be similar calculations to things that you're going to need to do in that experiment, by the way. So let's say you, let's say it took 35 milliliters of a 0 0.425 molar sodium hydroxide solution to neutralize um, to neutralize 25 milliliters of phosphoric acid. What is the molarity of the phosphoric acid? All right, take a couple minutes, see what you work out. Again, follow the same sort of steps. We are looking for something slightly different here at the end. We are looking for molarity. So see what you come up with and then we'll talk about it. I'll do it as well because I just made it up. Hopefully we'll all get the same answer. See how we do. The molarity of the uh, sodium hydroxide is 0.425.
Okay, so let's take a look and see how we're doing. So again, similar type of problem, obviously, that we've been working on. Titration problem, really still, um, really just a solution stoichiometry problem. So since that keyword there is stoichiometry, we're just going to continue like we have been. These we need an equation. So again, remember, really these acid-base reactions, which are very, very super common titration problems. Um, when you're trying to figure out that reaction, really just think about salt and water, right? So you almost, in most cases, could just lay up the water real quick and go, I'm pretty safe on that. Again, for the most part, nine times out of 10, the water is gonna come from the H from the acid, the OH from the base. So again, the salt part is going to come from the other guys here. And again, this really is our double displacement, positive, negative guy, positive, negative guy. The important part is, as we talked about a lot already at this point, we want to make sure that we first get the correct formula. So sodium here is plus one, phosphate is minus three. So when you put it together on this side, you're going to get sodium phosphate, which looks like this, Na3PO4. So remember that the order in which you do this is correct formulas first, and then you want to make sure you're balanced. So in this particular case, we're not balanced. Uh, we do see three sodiums on the right and only one on the left. So we could put a three in front of the sodium hydroxide. When we do that, uh, that is going to give us three H's there and three H's there. And we only have two here. So we also need a three in front of the H2O to balance it. And at that point, we should be balanced. Uh, three sodiums, uh, I got six hydrogens. Oxygens, I have a lot, but uh, was that seven? I got seven on each side and a phosphorus as well. So again, really important to get down this equation, get it balanced. And again, that is the order as we've been talking about that you should do it, correct formulas, just like we did with nomenclature, and then go back and balance it with coefficients. Any questions on the equation? All right. Same thing, if you're not really sure where to start at this point, we can just think about the information from the problem. We see for our sodium hydroxide that we have 35 milliliters. We also have a molarity of 0.425. For our uh, H3PO4, we have a volume of 25 milliliters we're actually looking for the molarity, right? So in this particular case, just like before, from that piece of information there, those two pieces of information, we do have enough to get to moles, which is a key thing. From these, this information over here, we're actually missing something, right? To allow us to get to what we're looking for. We're again missing moles. So, you can see you have moles here you can get to, but you don't have moles here. So again, that's where the stoichiometry part comes into play. So we're gonna start this the same way as we did the previous ones. We're gonna really convert to moles, right? And that's almost like your second step there in the stoichiometry problem. Again, the difference here is we're using volume and molarity to do that. So our 35 milliliters becomes 0 0.035 liters. We're going to use the molarity as a conversion factor. 0 0.425 moles per liter of our sodium hydroxide. Liters are going to cancel, going to get us 0 0.014, we'll call it 88, we'll go a couple digits, 0 0.0148 moles of sodium hydroxide. So again, at this point, as we've been before, we're kind of stuck here, but we're ultimately interested in the H3PO4, which is over here. And as we talked about, that is what the stoichiometry part is. The importance of having a balanced equation is we can see it is not a one-to-one -one relationship. It is actually a one-to-three relationship for every one mole of H3PO4, you get three moles of sodium hydroxide. So we're going to use that to get to the moles. So using our 0 0.01488 
moles of sodium hydroxide. We're actually going to be dividing by three. Three moles of sodium hydroxide on the bottom, one mole of phosphoric acid on top. The moles of sodium hydroxide will cancel and we will end up with point zero zero four nine and we'll call five eight five eight moles of h three p o four questions up to that point there so now we have the moles of our phosphoric acid we do have the volume of our phosphoric acid and this is going to be a little bit different than what we did on the previous examples here we now do have enough information to get to molarity, right? Because molarity is moles per liter. We just got our moles. The liters were given to us in the problem. So we basically just need to plug it in there. So the molarity here of our phosphoric acid would be the moles of it. divided by the liters. So we do have to do one last conversion here. We need to take our 25 milliliters and convert it into liters. Again, divide by a thousand or move that decimal point three places to the left. And if we do that, taking our moles, divided by 0 0.025 gives us a molarity of 0 0.198 unit wise you can leave it one of two ways like we talked about yesterday you can leave it as moles per liter or you could go 0 0.198 big m 198 big m and again this would be h3po4 any questions on that step so hopefully again you can kind of see the similar parts Step number one, balance equation. Step number two, convert to moles. Step number three, mole to mole relationship. And sort of a new wrinkle here on step number four, we are actually calculating the molarity instead of a volume or grams or something like that, which is again is a very common calculation to do. Any questions on any of those steps where any of those numbers came from, titration problems in general? Okay, so hopefully this is starting to make some sense, I hope. And again, this is going to be very similar calculations to what you're going to need to do in the next experiment next week for that big titration experiment. Any questions on that? Okay, so it's kind of the end of lecture here. Also end of like week five. Yeah, so we've got like three more to go. We're in the back nine for sure. Yes, so almost there. Um, so for today in lab, what I'm gonna do is gonna do, we're gonna do a couple of things. We're actually gonna continue lecturing on what we're doing here so we can finish up this chapter, kind of stay on pace. And then afterwards, what's on tap for today in terms of the lab is uh, the stoichiometry study assignment, if I'm not mistaken, which should be study assignment G. So uh, that's, I think, the plan. We're gonna lecture, we'll finish this up. I'll probably give you some extra time, obviously, to do the uh, study assignment since we're gonna use some of that time for lecturing. And uh, that will be due at some point. I'm going to decide what day that will be due, but I'll let you know in lab. Any questions on any of that there? As of now, it is tentatively still going to be uh, next Thursday. I'm, I am thinking about it. it, it our, the question is our, our exam, our next exam is scheduled for uh, next Thursday. So tentatively, as of now, it's going to probably be still there. But I am thinking about maybe options and not I and mean, we'll see where we are and stuff like that so either it will remain at um either it will remain on thursday and uh maybe not all of chapter eight which is gases i think will be on it or i may move it to monday and we'll finish up gases so i'm still sort of debating that so tentatively as of now still on thursday but probably more to come on monday we'll kind of see maybe where we're at on monday um in terms of material and stuff like that okay so the other option would be maybe to move it to Monday, but then we have our next exam on that Thursday as well. So I just gotta look at the schedule and kind of think about it. Other questions on that?
Okay, so uh, we'll start lab about 9.45-ish there, and we'll continue lecturing, kind of finish up this chapter, and, uh, and then officially study assignment G is what we can do for the rest of the time. All right, I'll see everybody in about 20 minutes.